To start, we're clearly long on cloud infrastructure and open source software. Here are some high level trends driving cloud and open source markets. We will cover them in detail. The three big cloud providers, Amazon, Microsoft, Azure, and Google, continue their rapid pace at scale. The collective revenue is over $100 billion, still growing at 40%, and there is significant room to run, as they are displacing over a $1 trillion of legacy software, hardware, and services spent. Infrastructure software companies that are riding on top of the three big cloud providers, think MongoDB, think Datadog, Snowflake, Databricks, and others, have come bouncing back since late last year and are now re-accelerating their growth rates. A big driver is digital transformation, where both legacy and newly minted companies across FinTech, last mile delivery, e-commerce, and almost every industry vertical is adopting cloud software to stay relevant in the post-COVID era. Specifically, infrastructure companies that had a strong business selling software on-premises to large enterprises have doubled down on their cloud-native SaaS offering, which is growing even faster and directly tied to a surge in these company valuations. Given these growth rates, it is not surprising that many of these companies have raised mega rounds this year. More importantly, companies outside the US, in Western Europe, India, Israel, for the very first time are raising these mega rounds earlier in their journey. I guess if you're building and selling cloud software over Zoom, it doesn't really matter if the customer is in New York and the company is in Tel Aviv or New Delhi, and that's helping both companies get access to growth funding and customers get access to the best software globally. The playing field has truly leveled and innovation and funding has gone global. With these rapid growth rates and large addressable markets, it is not surprising to see IPO valuations on day one grow to 10 billion this year on average versus one to three billion just a few years ago. Public investors are getting comfortable with durable growth rates at 500 million to a billion dollar scale and rewarding these companies with strong day one valuations. Despite these strong growth rates, we feel this is still the beginning and remaining very excited about the growth potential for cloud software companies ahead. Specifically, we see over a trillion dollars of disruption potential as legacy software, hardware, and services will be displaced by cloud software in the years ahead, all while expanding the pie for overall IT spending. Most metrics we track from overall cloud computing spend to cloud titan revenues and average cloud infrastructure IPO values is expected to grow in the decade ahead, and we remain very excited to be involved in this massive area of growth. Now, shifting gears a bit, what are some of the new themes that we at Battery find interesting? As many of you may know, we tend to be domain-centric with a strong focus in the cloud software space, but are open to early stage Series A and Series B rounds once they have some product market fill, as well as late stage pre-IPO companies. And look for these companies across the globe using our offices in US, Europe, and Israel. Of the six to 7,000 companies we see every year, we start seeing patterns and will cover some of the key areas of interest here. First, we are seeing new frameworks such as Jamstack, API First, and WebAssembly emerge to drive a faster pace of quality software development. The one mantra is that you just can build software fast enough. With that, every aspect of software development, not just the runtime, but design time, development, and testing is moving rapidly to a cloud native platform. Next, you can't wait for software to deploy to production before securing it. We are seeing security embedded earlier and earlier in the development lifecycle with developers securing their software as they build it. And we expect application security to be a very productive area in the years ahead. Now shifting gears, in the artificial intelligence or machine learning sector, there is a push to standardizing and speeding up development and deployment of models at scale. We're seeing the emergence of a standard tool chain for end-to-end -end machine learning, all the way from data labeling, to preparation, to model building, to feature stores, deployment, and monitoring, all of that geared towards a faster push of models in runtime. Put it all together, you see speed and standardization across the software and machine learning lifecycle 
ultimately push innovation much faster. You combine that with increased cloud capacity and lower unit costs, and you can very quickly see you're unleashing new startups across many areas, from crypto to fintech to healthcare and drug discovery. Just as standardization of internet protocols gave way to emergence of social networks and e-commerce two decades ago, we are seeing cloud software and machine learning accelerate innovation at the application layer in many industries. Slightly more tactical point here, but many of these enabling cloud and machine learning technologies are seeing rapid adoption and usage of their products earlier in the buying journey. And they have to rethink how their markets sell and expand to these customers based on early usage signals. That in turn is giving way to a new class of go-to-market tools, think Salesforce 2.0, Marketo 2.0, and the next generation of tools for product-led companies. And that's an area we continue to see tremendous innovation in as well. I know many of the founders and CEOs in the audience here today represent the areas we have covered and are building great businesses, which will create lasting value. But as many of you know, it is not a straight path from one to 100 million and from 100 million to a billion. There are several best practices across product design, user engagement, land and expand go to market that we have learned from our 150 portfolio companies every year and from the last 35 years of being in business focusing on software companies. In the following section, I'll cover the 10 most relevant operational best practices that can help you optimize growth opportunities in this post-COVID era. The first point is somewhat obvious, but it's important to understand how we got here and what it means for the path ahead. Last year, post-COVID, we saw many companies struggle where sales, product managers, customer success could not meet customers in person or set up in-person proof of concepts or whiteboarding sessions and they were forced to have prospects try their cloud-hosted SaaS product. Necessity is the mother of invention, as they say. They quickly found that marketing and sales could actually get strong early signals of engagement and buying intent via their cloud product. Product managers and engineers could get early feedback in almost real time from their customers to design better products. And we've seen cloud-native become the primary mode of engagement, most certainly for trials, but even for production scale deployments in this post-COVID era. Now, that's not to say you have to give up on enterprise sales altogether. We have found that the best companies are using cloud-based product engagement along with enterprise selling to engage small to medium customers and mid-market while optimizing for the lifetime value of enterprise customers. Say for instance, an engineer at Goldman Sachs engages with Elasticsearch, they still need an enterprise sales executive to handle the complexity of dealing with multiple departments, economic buyers, champions, procurement, and ultimately getting it to a seven-figure deal, right? MongoDB, for instance, has a cloud product Atlas at an even higher scale and growth rate than their on-premises product, and a lot of it is cloud engagement first, followed by enterprise sales later in the journey. So keep in mind, it's not either or, you can use cloud product engagement combined with enterprise sales to optimize your value across a spectrum of customers. Now, what does that mean for marketers and community managers though? The thing you have to recognize is that awareness is not the same as engagement. I see many community managers and founders even quote, hey, I have 100 million open source downloads, I got a million users in Slack, I got 10,000 forks, I have 50,000 pull requests. All of that is great. It doesn't mean much if you can get any telemetry on the user or any signal really on their buying intent. It's more important to hook the user to try the cloud product and learn from that. For instance, Open source company like Styra, which is behind a very popular open policy agent, has used that training or certification to drive their open source users to try their cloud product. Freemium products like Snowflake or Postman have given free trials and usage credits to get users in the cloud ecosystem to try the product. That is a very important leading indicator to get users engaged with their product before you understand 
their buying intent. Many times founders will come to us and say, hey, I got enough of my open source or freemium users to try the product. What is good enough in terms of converting it? Well, this is an exact science. We've studied this across tens of companies that are both pre-IPO and IPO, and we've generalized this a bit, but we found the rule of 20 as a fairly good proxy for conversion. What do I mean by that? First, the best companies often get 20% of their open source or Slack or Discord users to sign up to the product, right? Second, once they sign up, we've seen 20% of these signups to activate their account, tie it to their Amazon cluster, and become active daily or weekly users, depending upon the use case. And finally, 20% of these active users are converting naturally to paid users. Once they have converted, most mid-market and enterprises have shown 80% plus gross retention and 130% net retention. Of course, there are variations depending upon the kind of product you're selling, but if you see your conversion ratios way off on any of these areas, it may be time to dig deeper. Number five, and this is perhaps one of the more important points. Once you get the user to try your cloud product, it is not really the sales rep or the sales engineer. That should do the hand-holding to help the user realize value. Most users, especially if they're technical, such as developers or DevOps or security, they prefer to discover value on their own. And frankly, the burden is on product designers to build products that naturally guide users through this journey from free to paid. Here we have several examples. We try to jam a lot of them because we have a lot of ideas on this subject. But for instance, Postman or Linear B injects their free users with collaboration features to drive virality, because collaboration drives more value and naturally invites more users. On the other hand, Grafana or Mongo will provide developers templates to get applications running faster, powered by their database, of course. Or even if it's simple things like guided navigation or documentation, the responsibility is for product folks to work hand in hand with community managers and marketers to think about a frictionless journey and drive conversion for a free to a paid user and embed that, build it in the product. Let the product do the talking because that's what users want to see. Number six, from a demand gen and sales perspective, you get really good usage signals and trends to understand buying intent, which ultimately translates to product qualified leads. Not something that your marketing team needs to qualify, but something that your product automatically qualifies. Now, not every lead needs to be served by a rep. That actually depends on the size of the opportunity. But what we're seeing for the very first time is that as companies scale, they're initially relying much more heavily on product qualified leads or PQLs versus traditional marketing qualified leads. And as they grow larger, these PQLs are even helping them penetrate larger enterprises with larger deal sizes. Just because you got a product qualified lead from a large organization doesn't mean it cannot translate to a six or seven figure deal. I think that is quite an interesting way to acquire high quality customers using a low friction mechanism. From a sales perspective, you have to stratify your sales organization based on the lifetime value of the customer and complexity of selling. Make no mistake, the product doesn't sell by itself in large organizations. You do need the savvy of an experienced sales team to navigate a six or seven figure deal with a Fortune 500 customer and structure a multi-year ratable or consumption deal with an MSA with procurement. On the other hand, an SMB deal with five figure potential can often transact on its own, either directly with the customer or through a cloud marketplace without a lot of sales involvement. This really helps you find the fine line between your sales cost and customer lifetime potential. I know my colleague Kelly Wright from Gong is going to talk a lot about the stratified sales organization and optimizing the customer journey in her talk. Number eight, we're seeing more and more consumption deals this year as cloud native products are relieving procurement and buyers from estimating usage especially for companies where perceived value is tied to usage, like Twilio for messaging, or Snowflake for data analytics, or Databricks for data science. Sales reps don't need to have customers estimate the usage upfront 
they can have customers sign up for multi-year deals and they pay as they go. They see the value, they consume more, they pay as they go. This is truly the best way to align interest between the customer and the software vendor. And this concept was clearly used at scale by Amazon, Azure, and many other cloud providers. This may result in some volatility in the short term as the usage patterns may go up and down. But in general, we have found that this is the best way to drive higher growth rates and retention, ultimately higher market capitalization, especially for companies where usage is directly tied to value. Number nine, to navigate this new normal of signups, engagement, product qualified leads, stratified sales, there's a whole new class of go-to-market tools that can help you in the journey. Think about what Salesforce, Marketo, Gainsight, Zora, Zendesk did for you when you transition to a recurring revenue model. Now, as you go to a cloud-native consumption model, there's a new class of go-to-market tools that can help you. More importantly, there's also more interaction between go-to-market teams and product teams that can help you iterate through the product development much faster. A few years ago, sales guys would sell the product, customer success would deploy it, eventually product managers would get feedback from customers months later to update their roadmap. Fast forward to today, it's all happening in minutes. Customer usage is providing signals to all teams all at once, which not only helps you engage and sell, but also continuously refine the products much faster than was ever possible before. And number 10, a direct consequence of all these new tooling and direct feedback from customers has also been the ability to test new products and drive more expansion sooner in the cycle. Atlassian, for example, recently pushed Jira online. Datadog, for instance, has been able to test several new features with feature flags and capture intent to expand usage of add-on products. For instance, Datadog has gone from the core monitoring product to 13 add-on products across their 10,000 customers, leveraging their cloud-native SaaS platform, which has ultimately resulted in much higher growth, much higher dollar retention, and a $40 billion market cap. Many of these operational best practices we have covered have long-term implications on your performance as a public company. We have seen more companies scale to a billion dollars and beyond, and we cover these at length in our Billion Dollar B2B podcast series. Investing the time now to build a strong foundation early will end up paying dividends as you scale as a public company a few years later. First, you'll see forward growth rate and efficiency as measured by Rule of 40 matter the most to a company's revenue multiple and market capitalization. The thinking goes that if cloud is a trillion dollar opportunity, then companies that can grow fast to get beyond a billion dollars in revenue and then optimize for efficiency will create iconic, long-lasting franchises. Also, in this environment of near zero interest rates, it's easier to raise dollars and invest for growth, so companies sub-billion dollars are getting rewarded for high growth, over efficiency, or cash flow. It's anyone's guess how sustainable this is, but for now, cloud companies growing 40 to 50% at sub-billion dollar scale are being rewarded quite nicely. On the next slide, we show another way to see the same data by normalizing enterprise value to revenue multiple with growth rate. Both high growers like Snowflake and Zscaler, and more importantly, companies with a cloud-native product like Mongo and Confluent are being rewarded nicely. The idea is that even if your growth is sub 40%, a faster growing cloud product at 80 or 100% will lift your overall revenue in the near term. Next, we talk about rule of 40 and efficiency. It also matters, but it's second to growth. For instance, Dynatrace has done very well on efficiency, but due to its sub 35% growth rate, it doesn't fetch a top quartile multiple. Efficiency truly starts to matter a lot more once you get to a billion dollars and have to scale on a measured basis. Next, we see IPO readiness based on last 12 months revenue. This is a backward looking view and shows that companies filing with a last 12 month growth of 70% plus albeit on a smaller scale, have had strong reception at the IPO. Whether they have sustained that performance depends on forward growth rates and cloud business presence, as we covered earlier. Magic number also matters. It's not that critical in the near term, 
but ultimately helps you scale your business more efficiently once you get past a billion dollars. Cloud-native businesses that lead with their product are inherently better suited to acquire customers more efficiently and have a better magic number than top-down motions. Next, we talk about dollar-based net retention at the IPO. Product-led companies have a more natural land expand motion, and that translates to a more natural expansion and a higher net dollar retention. This is a strong leading indicator of forward growth as it is easier to drive growth dollars from existing customers versus acquiring new customers. So it matters a lot to long-term growth rates. You've seen companies with sub 120% net dollar retention click down to a lower tier multiple versus the companies with 140% net dollar retention get a premium multiple since their 50% growth rates look a lot more reasonable. Next, we talk about lifetime value to customer acquisition cost. Ultimately, net dollar retention and magic numbers are different measures of efficiency and translate to a higher lifetime value to customer acquisition cost ratio. In the short term, it really helps to make operational decisions. For instance, if your LTV to CAC is over 3x, you have room to invest more aggressively for growth without compromising efficiency much. The next slide here, we see R&D and sales marketing as a percentage of revenue. Frankly, there isn't much signal here other than your motion should mirror the right ratio. Product-led companies, for instance, will have higher R&D dollars, but you should get a lot more leverage on sales and marketing as you can acquire customers more efficiently. Finally, here we have a quick summary of key performance indicators that companies have disclosed, and they may be pertinent to you as you consider your own IPO. A detailed discussion is beyond the scope here, but you can always reach out our team if you would like to discuss it further. By now, we have covered the operational best practices you can implement early in the company cycle and how that discipline can build a strong foundation for growth, even as a public company, years later. Now, let me move to the summary slides to wrap up the presentation. Needless to say, the cloud-native software space is firing on all cylinders, from financings to mega deal value to the rate of iconic companies being built. For what it's worth, going public is just a stop in the journey. We've seen several companies 5x their value from pre-IPO rounds to an IPO, and 3x their value post-IPO. So it feels like the IPO just gives you the dry powder and street cred to go even bigger. We're seeing more companies scale to a billion dollars in revenue while still growing 40 to 50% for the very first time. And Snowflake even talked about their path to 10 billion recently. As you can see in this slide, most of the public companies have material upside in their beaten race patterns, giving us confidence that there is headroom. Most of this headroom is in their cloud growth, where companies are beating and raising by meaningful amounts, helping their value appreciate further. All of this points to the fact that at a macro level, COVID has accelerated software adoption. Most software is being delivered in a cloud-native fashion. As long as three major cloud providers grow from 100 billion combined to a trillion dollars, while maintaining their 30 to 40% growth rate, companies indexed to cloud-native have meaningful room to grow. It's a great time to be an entrepreneur in the cloud-native space. I don't need to tell you that. We hope you've captured a few things about building and scaling your cloud business from the content we covered today. As the software pie grows, mostly in the cloud space, and your business grows, please keep us in mind if you can help with anything, whether it be your product strategy, early scaling, or go-to-market best practices. This is your battery team here to help anytime.